Straight Edges, Chapter 19, The New Writings, or The Greatest True Story Ever Told, Part 2. To go back to our imaginary courtroom, is there any evidence to show that the eyewitness testimony of the New Testament is untrue? Otherwise, if it were a courtroom situation, we would accept eyewitness testimony. But in this situation, all the lawyers can say is, Objection! Yeah, right, likely story. It's really the only argument a skeptic can make against the testimony of the witnesses of the Gospels, just that their stories don't seem very likely. These kinds of stories don't happen every day, but we've agreed that statistical probability can have no bearing on this case. If the jury is expected to believe that the witness is telling bare-faced lies, the jury would at least want to know what motives a witness may have for telling bare-faced lies, Why would someone get up in a courtroom, swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and then start in on a pack of barefaced lies? People do it, but they generally have some reason. A common reason is self-preservation, or, along the same lines, gain. People tell lies in a courtroom or elsewhere to get themselves out of trouble, or to protect someone else, or to put money in their pockets, or otherwise benefit themselves. But this motive falls apart in microseconds if we try to apply it to the situation we're talking about. You don't have to know much about history around the first century AD to know that the early followers of this man Jesus got themselves in a whole mess of trouble. If the events written in the Gospels were a pack of lies or a forgery, they didn't help the early Christians self-preserve. They've never helped anyone self-preserve. All throughout the history of the years Anno Domini, the new writings caused more trouble than they got anyone out of. Lying for self-preservation is not going to fly as a motive for the writing of the Gospels. Another reason I can think of that people tell lies is for self-aggrandizement. I mean, they lie to make themselves look bigger and more important. Does this offer a very good motive for the writing of the Gospels? Not exactly, when the only person aggrandized through them is the person of Jesus Christ. The disciples often come off looking foolish, and the Gospels claim to have been written by the disciples or those closely connected with them. If that's a lie, too, then we have no idea who wrote them, and that doesn't fit in well with the self-aggrandizement idea. Here's another reason I've heard given for why anyone would tell lies like the Gospels if, in fact, they're lies. They were written for the self-preservation and self-aggrandizement of the Church. A few centuries into its existence, the Church found it needed something to help prop it up and keep it going, to support the faithful in their beliefs, and so the Gospels were concocted. This theory has one main problem. If the legends of the New Testament Gospels were born after the Church, what Church exactly? The faithful? Faithful to what, exactly? If the Church was already well along in its existence before the basic tenets of the Gospel had been conceived, I'll say the Church would need some propping up. It would have materialized out of thin air in the first place. If there were no Gospels, or at least no Gospel, singular, to begin with, then out of what substance could the Church have spontaneously generated itself? This point will come up again. I find myself stumped trying to discover why anyone would want to write such lies as the New Writings, if they are indeed lies. We can't rule out absolutely the possibility that the New Testament is a pack of lies, however. People do lie sometimes for no apparent reason. But there also doesn't seem to be any historical evidence that contradicts the New Writings to give us reasons for believing they must have been lies. On the other hand, I'd like to talk about two facts we have right in front of us that seem to me to be strong evidence that support the truth of the New Writings. The first we've looked at already, the Old Testament prophecies apparently fulfilled in Jesus. If the Gospels are lies, we have to have some explanation for these Old Testament prophecies. The usual explanation offered for apparently fulfilled Old Testament prophecies and here I mean the explanation usually offered by those who don't believe in prophecy or don't believe it could be fulfilled, is that the prophecy was written after the event. Those who offer this explanation make no bones about it. They have no problem calling these prophecies lies. For example, perhaps the most striking of historically fulfilled prophecies, or not, depending on the bias, would be prophecies from the book of Daniel. Several times, Daniel prophesies future world powers that did, in fact, become world powers. In Daniel 8, the Medes and Persians and the Greeks are specified by name as the empires that would take over the known world. 
how is this possible if Daniel prophesied, as stated, in the time of the Babylonian domination before anyone had heard of Alexander the Great? The answer is plain, says the skeptic. Daniel, or this prophecy in Daniel, was written after Alexander made his entrance. Daniel predicts other world powers that were to come after Greece, though. In Daniel 2, we read of Nebuchadnezzar's dream that Daniel interpreted. This dream was about a statue with a head of gold, chest and arms of silver, belly and thighs of bronze, and legs of iron with feet of iron mixed with clay. In the dream, a stone cut out without hands came and struck the statue on its feet. The statue fell and crumbled away into dust. Then the stone became a great mountain that filled the whole earth. Daniel interpreted the dream as being all about different kingdoms, starting with Nebuchadnezzar as the head of gold. If we wanted to give names to these kingdoms represented by the different parts of the statue, it wouldn't be hard. The golden head, that's Nebuchadnezzar's Babylon, as Daniel said. That would make the silver chest and arms the kingdom of Persia or Medo-Persia. Next, the bronze belly and thighs of Greece. And finally, the iron legs of Rome and the iron and clay feet of Rome's uneasy amalgamation with all the nations it conquered. So far, so good. The different empires fit the different pieces of the statue fairly well, I'd say. Would that mean that Daniel was written in the time of the Romans? Or would it mean that whoever wrote the book of Daniel made a lucky guess and kept the prophecy vague enough that whatever happened, it would look like it was fulfilled? For now, I just wanted to talk about how the skeptics would get around this apparently fulfilled prophecy of the statue. They would point out that it's easy to write the story if you already know how the story goes because you saw it happen. That's all I wanted to say about this prophecy for now. Just use it as an example of the skeptic's explanation. But we're not done with it yet. Hang on to this statue story. It comes up again later. The usual explanation for fulfilled prophecy might be conceivable in the cases of some prophecies. How does the usual explanation stack up against the suffering and dying God prophecies? Does anyone suggest that these Old Testament prophecies were written after the fact of Jesus' life and death to bolster support for him and his following? I don't know that I've heard anyone suggest such a theory, and for obvious reasons. Take the clearest example, the prophecy I quoted to you in an earlier chapter from Isaiah 53. Does anyone seriously attempt to say that it was written after the time of Christ? If so, all I could answer is that it would show that a person hasn't looked into it, had no idea what he was talking about, and was madly grasping at straws to get around something he didn't want to be true. I think it's pretty generally accepted that the Old Testament was completed many years before Jesus lived, but even if I'm wrong, and that's not generally accepted, think about it. Scripture-believing Jews today, most of whom don't accept Jesus as the Messiah, accept this passage as part of their holy scriptures. Could you imagine how that state of affairs could have come to be if the passage was written after the time of Christ by his followers? Can you imagine a forger trying to insert prophecies like this one into the pages of the Jewish scriptures? With the high regard the Jews had for their scriptures, and with the thorough knowledge the Jews had of their scriptures, and with the determination of the majority of Jewish leaders at that time to stamp out Christianity, can you imagine any forger managing this feat so successfully that Jews today accept these scriptures as their own? Obviously, any attempt at that kind of forgery would have met with a hue and cry, not with open arms. The idea is ludicrous. So then, what explanation can the person offer who is reluctant to see the suffering Messiah prophecies as being fulfilled in Jesus? I believe that in the case of Isaiah 53, those who believe in Isaiah but don't believe in Jesus explain the passage by saying that it's not really about the Messiah at all. It's referring to the nation of Israel as God's suffering servant. There is a great deal of truth to the nation being a suffering one. History has shown us that. But that interpretation simply doesn't fit with the entire message of the passage or the rest of the book. The message of Isaiah 53 is that the suffering servant would suffer for the sins of the world, not having any of his own. The message of a great deal of the rest of the book of Isaiah is that Israel would indeed suffer, but for their own sins, having plenty of their own, just like the rest of the world. So far, I'm not exactly compelled by any explanation to get around Old Testament prophecy being fulfilled in Jesus. But here's another one. Knowing the prophecies, isn't it possible that Jesus' followers after him made up a bunch of stuff that never happened to make it look like Jesus had fulfilled prophecy? Taking this theory to its extreme are those who doubt the existence of any historical Jesus whatsoever. Jesus. 
The idea is hard to take seriously, and most people don't. I'll mention it here anyway. Jesus indisputably had followers very shortly after the time he was supposed to have lived. What could his followers have been following if there was no person named Jesus at all? Of all the theories about who Jesus was, the theory that he wasn't demonstrates nothing so clearly as the bias and wishful thinking of those who can convince themselves to hold it. The facts that Jesus lived and that he died by crucifixion are pretty inarguable and are confirmed by secular history and historians. Josephus, Tacitus, Suetonius, Pliny the Younger, Epictetus, Lucian, Aristides, Galenus. That's one problem with the idea that Jesus' followers made stuff up to fit with the Old Testament prophecies. They didn't make up the crucifixion. But there are other problems. There's this matter to be reckoned with that Jesus' followers, before his death, according to the Gospels, had somehow missed the implications of all the dying God prophecies, that God's Son, God himself, would come to earth, meet with general rejection, and die for sin was not the common idea in Jewish minds at that time. Nor is it today. Although to my 21st century eyes the prophecies seem clear and unequivocal, somehow they passed right over the disciples' heads until after the fact. From, allegedly, the disciples' own accounts, Jesus would tell them he was going to suffer and die, and they'd flatly contradict him. He'd tell them he was going to rise from the dead, and they'd wonder what he was on about. By their own admission, they overlooked the suffering-dying prophecies until they had happened, because they had all their hopes pinned on the conquering, reigning prophecies the Old Testament is full of. These admissions have the ring of truth, and I believe that's exactly how it must have happened when I see how veiled the suffering-dying prophecies are to the eyes of those who don't believe the Gospels. But there they are, plain as day for all the world to read. Whatever the theory used to get around the suffering-dying prophecies apparently fulfilled by Jesus' life and death, none of them can explain the existence of the prophecies themselves. These kinds of prophecies would have been more likely to be chopped out of the scriptures if people dared mess with the scriptures than forged in, seeing they don't seem to fit with all the conquering reigning prophecies or with people's ideas about what the Messiah should be like. They leave a discordant note. No one would have thrown them in if he was merely writing his own ideas. Why would they be there at all if they weren't God's idea? I've said that these Old Testament suffering servant prophecies that seem to be so perfectly fulfilled by Jesus are one piece of evidence that we have to contend with. If a person doesn't want to believe that Jesus fulfilled these prophecies, there's only one option. He has to see the whole thing as one giant coincidence. We'll say that coincidences, even giant ones, aren't impossible and leave it there for now. I want us to move on to that second piece of evidence I mentioned earlier. That second piece of evidence is simply the existence of a group of followers of Jesus Christ. I mean, the Christian Church. The Church is a cold, hard fact that takes some explaining if Jesus was not who the new writings claim he was. Three of the four Gospels record Jesus making this statement, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Matthew 24, verse 35, Mark 13, verse 31, Luke 21, verse 33. Does this sound familiar? Sounds very much like the Old Testament prophets saying God's words will never pass away, except in this case, it's Jesus saying my words will never pass away. In Matthew 16, verse 18, Jesus announced that he would build his church and that the gates of hell would not prevail against it. He would build his church and it would stay built. Now, this is also sounding very much like an echo from the Old Testament. In the writings, we're told that God's words will never pass away. In the new writings, we're told that Christ's words will never pass away. In the writings, we're told that God will establish his nation Israel and it will stay established. In the new writings, we're told that Christ will establish his church and it will stay established. Now, the interesting thing is that all these promises have so far come true. The Bible is still standing, and so is the nation Israel, so is the Church of Christ. These are the facts. Whatever a person wants to believe about the Bible being a book of lies written not by God, but by liars, he has to take into account the fact that it is the book that made all these promises which have come true so far. Why should Christ's words be carrying on? Why should Christ's church be carrying on? Unless there was something out of the ordinary about him. Unless he was no ordinary man. And if the skeptics are right, and God has no son, and Jesus was just an ordinary man, then not only why is the church still standing, but why did it ever come to be in the first place? That's a question for which I can find no answer if the Gospels are lies.
To go back to an earlier point, if the church wasn't founded on the basic premises of the Gospels, if those Gospels were written generations after the church was in existence, if the message of the Gospels wasn't the starting point but evolved over time, what could the church have been founded on? In Matthew 16, Jesus said he would build his church on a rock, and that rock was the truth Peter had just blurted out. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God, verse 16. But if the church wasn't built on that rock, if that idea hadn't even entered people's minds at the time of the founding of the church, why was it founded? What exactly did those first followers of Jesus, who got the whole ball rolling, go around preaching that got that ball rolling? We could argue and speculate about what Jesus did or didn't do, that is, if we toss out the gospel records, because his life wasn't well documented by secular history. However, after his death, his following grew so rapidly and was so hard to ignore that secular history does have something to tell us about what happened with his early followers, and it wasn't pretty. Even without leaning on the Gospels as our source, we can look at history and the early church to answer the question, who was Jesus? What does his church have to tell us about who he was? Perhaps people were so desperate to find a Messiah that they built a sect around someone who could fit the suffering servant profile, so they chose a common criminal crucified for his crimes. Are you seeing a problem? A criminal who is executed for his crimes is not usually the obvious choice to build a religion around. Doesn't seem very likely that Jesus was just a common criminal. Yet, it seems very likely that he was crucified. But why would he have been crucified? The Romans didn't generally go around crucifying lowly carpenters without some kind of reason. So who was he really if he wasn't a common criminal and he wasn't just a lowly carpenter? What had Jesus done to attract the attention of Rome? What had he done to tread on Caesar's toes? If Jesus was, as the popular idea today goes, just a nice, though rather insipid moral teacher who went around handing out nice, though rather insipid moral advice, the church of his followers would have been much different than it was, and is. I very much doubt that Jesus ever struck anyone who met him as nice but insipid. Firebrand would be a better description for him by the mark he left on the world. And firebrands, literally, are what his followers became all too often. So many of Christ's followers down through the centuries have died because they were his followers. Nice but insipid doesn't usually get a person killed, and nice but insipid doesn't inspire other people to get themselves killed. Passing out moral advice has never been a capital offense anywhere. If that's all Jesus and his followers did, we would have a very hard time explaining why they started dying like flies at the hands of the Roman government. Even harder to explain is why they continued to multiply like flies in spite of it. Church growth exploded in the first century. Before the end of the first century, the ball those early disciples of Jesus got rolling snowballed. In the first century and in those that followed, the movement grew to the point where the Christians managed to get under the emperor's skin, to the extent that they became public enemies number one, and that under several different emperors. But that only seemed to add fuel to their fire. What could have caused the Christian movement to snowball like it did in such a short time? If those early ball rollers went around preaching nice but insipid moral advice, it's hard to imagine the movement snowballing or getting under anyone's skin. What could they have gone around preaching that was so revolutionary and so threatening that a very decided attempt was made to silence them? Jesus must have been more than just a moral teacher. So was he, in fact, a revolutionary, standing up and shaking his fist at Rome then? That he was crucified for the alleged crime of treason seems to be the most likely surmise. And that is what the Gospels tell us. After all, the Jews were expecting their Messiah to come and free them from the hand of Rome. And Rome was a little bit touchy about people wanting to be free from its hand. But if Jesus wanted to overthrow the might of Rome, what do we do with the fact that his followers so completely failed to follow him in this regard after his death, even though themselves were killed in a mass for no good reason? If they were going to die, anyway, and the whole movement had started off as a resistance movement, then, for pity's sake, why didn't they try to resist? But there is no record of any kind of civil action at all on the part of the early Christians. Quite the opposite. Christians being torn to bits by lions or being torched at Nero's garden parties, singing hymns of praise with their last breaths, that sort of thing. That's the picture we're given of the early Christians. However biased you may think that picture, 
You must know that history records no attempt at a political movement on their part. If Jesus was a zealot working to take down Rome, and if that was why he was crucified, we would have a very hard time explaining why on earth a man whose one goal in life was to lead an underground resistance, who met with such glaring failure as to die ignominiously as a criminal without any recorded uprising, except for perhaps one lopped off ear, Mark 14 verse 47, would suddenly, after that ignominious death, gain a much larger following than he had when he was alive especially when his followers proceeded to do anything other than put up any kind of resistance. Maybe we could combine theories and decide that Jesus was ever only a nice but insipid moral advice giver, but because his following grew so large and so rapidly, the civil authorities saw him as a threat and mistook him for a revolutionary, and so his crucifixion was all a big misunderstanding. But this still doesn't explain the behavior of his followers after his death. If you were a follower of a nice but insipid moral teacher who clumsily got himself executed, and you saw him die that horrible and painful death, would you run right out and announce yourself as his disciple and start preaching in his name? If you still believed in his moral advice, you'd probably try to practice it quietly and in private. Or you might be angry enough to try for revenge against the authorities who crucified him and so begin plotting the uprising the government was expecting. Neither of these understandable reactions is compatible with what history tells us about the early church. Jesus' followers were emphatically not quiet and private about what they practiced and preached. We know this from the boom in early church growth. The existence of a body like the church so soon after the time when Jesus is supposed to have lived and died is a powerful historical testimony to some dramatic direction-changing event like the coming back to life of a dead man. The existence of the church today is a powerful testimony to Jesus' resurrection. Speaking of history and Jesus' followers, if you don't happen to believe that Jesus was who the Gospels claim he was, you have a really gigantic coincidence to swallow. It's a fact of history that Christ did indeed conquer Caesar. With the Emperor Constantine's conversion, history tells us that the non-political movement of Christianity suddenly had very political effects on the world. Constantine's conversion began the long years of Christendom. The world began to consider itself a kingdom ruled over by Christ, hence Christendom. I now find the coincidence growing a bit too gigantic to be swallowed comfortably as coincidence. What on earth is some obscure carpenter teacher firebrand from Israel doing conquering the entire Roman world, which the Romans thought was the entire world, all without striking a single blow? But even more staggering, what do you make of the fact that such a conquering was predicted in advance? Not only do the Gospels record Jesus saying that he would build his church and the gates of hell would not withstand it, but remember Nebuchadnezzar's dream about the statue and the little rock that brought it tumbling down? There's no way we can bump the date on that prophecy ahead until after the time of Constantine. But it sure looks to me as though the prophecy of the little rock began to see fulfillment through Christ's church in his time. Under Constantine, it really began to see fulfillment. Who did we calculate that the iron legs and the feet on the statue belonged to? Right, Rome, the last of the world empires. And whose feet did the little rock, cut out without hands, come and strike, bringing the entire statue to its knees? Right again, Rome's. And then remember that the little rock grew till it became a mighty mountain filling the whole earth. And what empire did Christ's little rock, surely not made by human hands, come and strike and bring to its knees? Right again, Rome. And then what happened? Sometime after the Roman Empire disappeared, it became a Christendom. Then that little rock grew till it became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. I can only swallow so much coincidence. You may be saying, but all of Christendom wasn't truly subject to Christ. It wasn't really his kingdom. And the church isn't some kind of great mountainous kingdom today. Well, all right, but don't forget that prophecies have a very long shelf life, like till heaven and earth pass away, and prophecies can have more than one fulfillment. I think the prophecy of the little rock that became a great mountain has only begun to be fulfilled. Don't forget all those conquering, reigning prophecies which this mountain filling the earth is part of. The new writings tell us repeatedly that Christ is coming back, this time as the conqueror, And then his kingdom won't be just a spiritual kingdom over willing subjects. This all could be fodder for another whole book, though. I'm going to leave it there.
All this was just to say that, like the little rock in the dream, the coincidence we're expected to swallow has grown rather mountainous. If Jesus wasn't the Messiah, wasn't the Son of God, his conquering the world in that way at that time of the Roman Empire really was a coincidence on par with the coincidence of the padded cell man claiming to be Napoleon, escaping from his cell and going out to conquer the world. No, actually, stranger, it would be more like the man from the padded cell going out to get himself killed almost immediately. Then, after his death, his measly following turns into a mighty ocean that rises up in his name to go out and conquer the world. All the stranger when you add to it the coincidence that it was predicted it would happen that way hundreds of years before it did. Personally, I'm more inclined to believe that Jesus was the Messiah, that he was the little rock hewn without human hands, that he was the Son of God, that he was the dying yet rising God. It seems to fit the facts better.